Um, we are here to play some, some games with some weird controllers. You can already see we got we got feet cam, so the chaos is already beginning. Um, I'm I'm subbing in for Super Lewis. We normally do this this week. Uh, we're gonna be playing some some Kirby Tilt and Tumble. So why don't I have my my two co-hosts? On July 30th, 2023, Zeldathon was live on Twitch with their weekly show, Controlled Chaos. The premise is that every week a game is played with a wacky or unusual control scheme. This week, Dynomation was playing Kirby Tilt and Tumble with the Game Boy player, with Dino tilting the entire system for motion control and pressing buttons with Donkey Kong bongos at his feet. A very important question was about to be asked in the chat. Explanation given. <laughs> Brutal. Zelda tilt I, and tumble <laughs> at Jar. <Jordan. laughs> <laughs> mm. Definitely for like the movement. The idea had been pitched as a joke, but immediately my mind started going through what it would take to make something like that happen. Zelda, to me, meant the first Legend of Zelda game, especially with the goal of having it working before the next event. I wanted to make something and make it quickly, and in order to get things to work the way I envisioned, this wouldn't be as simple as patching an original NES game. I'd basically be rewriting the whole thing from scratch. I fired up my text editor and started making notes. In the interest of speed, I used JavaScript, which allows me to do silly things at a turbo pace. I wanted to keep as faithful as I could to the original game. In fact, my first mental image was someone holding a controller, seeing themselves on the starting screen, and not being able to figure out how to move until they tilted the controller a bit. In order to keep Link looking like he did in the original game, I started with a voxel model of Link based on the amiibo figurine, and I made a sprite sheet of a set of rotations. I faked the tilt movement with keyboard controls, but this led to an interesting discovery. So, it looks okay when you roll like that, and it looks okay when you roll like that, but when you get out of alignment, weird things happen. After filling a few notebook pages with some awful high school trigonometry, I realized something. I already had the 3D model of Link that I used to generate the sprites, and JavaScript has a library available called 3.js. Why not draw Link in 3D and have the rest of the world in 2D? Once I swapped this in, I had a very minimal proof of concept, which I immediately sent back to Clinkit. At that moment, it clicked that this joke idea could actually become something playable. The next major question was fleshing out the idea of controls. The first few demos I'd produced faked tilting with keyboard controls, and from making Madoku's digits, I knew how to use a gamepad's analog sticks, but neither one was a genuine tilt mechanic. My first impulse was to check if I was on a device that natively had position sensors built in, in my case, an Android cell phone. This absolutely allowed for motion-based controls and gave us a few options to capture the game screen, although it did cause some performance hiccups that I'd have to work through. It was enough to allow me to start fleshing out the rest of the game, however, so I got to work on the next part of the project. The original Legend of Zelda map is not ridiculously large by modern standards, although it was impressive for its time. With the age of the game, Screen captures and images of maps are easy to find on the internet, but they're just that, images. Converting all of these into the tile map format I needed called for some other tools, such as the tiled map editor, and a whole lot of patience. Luckily, all the maps showed where items and enemies were located in the overworld and in dungeons. Unluckily, I had to type in the coordinates by hand for all of them. Once all the data was in place, it was a matter of going back to add the behaviors for all of the enemies. For this, I would need an additional reference. Descriptions on the internet were helpful, but the best source of truth would be to go back and play through the original game. In the interest of fairness, the behavior of some enemies was changed. 
It was at this point that my good friend Jiggy11 made the first of three suggestions that would genuinely change the shape of this project. He suggested that I check out the speedrun guide on the Zelda Dungeon website, which lists a stage called The Gathering. The Gathering is a strategy that gets your hero as powerful as possible before you even tackle first dungeon. Starting from The Gathering, I now had a prioritized order to go through and build out anything that was missing. As I went through and filled out the rest of the elements of the game, Jiggy made his second suggestion that would change the nature of the project. He suggested dropping the mobile plan and using a Switch Pro controller for the motion controls for the PC. I grabbed a Switch Pro controller, found a library to support the gyroscopic input from it, and started changing the control scheme a little bit. Now that I had access to an analog stick again, we moved from the sword and all usable items heading out in the direction of the player to being controllable with the left analog stick. The new control scheme worked fantastically, but it led to the third and grandest of Jiggy's suggestions, which is that we uncap the movement speed. Originally, my overcautious nature had led me to put an upper bound on the speed the player could move, and to some extent there had to be based on the way the game worked and checked for collisions, but we could definitely remove some of the governance and lead to ridiculously high speeds. As we were doing this, it dawned on me that I could change the rate of the background music to connect to the speed the player was moving at, and this is something everyone has commented on when they see it first. Part of the bit was being kept secret from players so that they didn't know what to expect going into it, but those in the know started to work on more promotional materials. A spoof commercial was produced to be run as a bumper during Zeldathon, immediately before the event, and maybe once or twice after. With the items and dungeons in place, the motion controls updated, the only part remaining was to wrap the game in a beginning and ending. I mirrored as closely as possible the original title sequence and ending sequence from the game. We added the Ganon fight and rescuing Princess Zelda, including an animation where you pick her up whatever direction you're oriented, and now the game was completable and beatable. In violation of my original goal of authenticity, but for a much needed laugh, I added guest appearances from a couple other characters you may know from the Zelda and Zeldathon universe. And on December 27th, the game was revealed live to the Zeldathon audience. Shoop, why don't we just start the video game? All right, so right. if I'm correct, no one has done this before either. This is a this a, is the no. The, you this are is the seeing first. history in the making. So Shoop, take it away. Zelda tilt and tumble. Tilt and tumble. All right, let's, let's go. go. Oh, okay. oh, what? Yo, look at what? Him go. Look at him go. I'm using tilt controls. <laughs> You're using tilt controls. <laughs> Yo, you no, you gotta get the sword. What is this? Get Shoop, get the sword. Get the sword. Get get the sword. Get the sword. Just right no, come on, get the sword. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Since this run, interest has only grown in the first public release of the game. No one has beaten this yet other than the creator. Legend of Zelda Tilt and Tumble? What? What in the hell? <laughs> and discussions are already underway to see it raced and speedrun. Requests have come in to make Ganon beatable in a swordless run. And all in all, Zelda Tilt and Tumble continues to grow. <laughs> that speeds up the music. Okay, that's funny.